Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sri Raman Chari. I, I'm from Cadence. I work in the IP group. Within IP, we have multiple different groups that create IP that software SOC designers license from us. I work in the Tensilica group. So I want to just make some comments about uh, AI accelerators, uh, accelerator IP that we've been building for three plus years now. Some observations along the way and some comments on uh, what the challenges were and you know, help, help out people who might be looking to license IP on what to look for. A uh, brief background on Tensilica. Uh, Tensilica is a leading supplier of uh, embedded CPUs and DSPs. The real claim to fame is user-defined extend, extensible architectures. It's particularly good for deeply embedded uh, applications where you're able to customize your hardware interfaces, you're able to define new instructions that can provide significant uplift in performance, and it's all supported with a tool chain that automatically generates collateral uh, profilers, debuggers, compilers to support the extensibility that you designed into it. We have a lot of customers who use our DSPs in many types of media processing, audio, vision, radar, baseband, so on. And a lot of these people are naturally moving to adding ML inferencing on the back end. And you have stream processing on the front end, you want to run some inferencing on it. So there's a natural fit to uh, extending our DSPs towards um, ML inferencing. So we have been working on a portfolio of uh, ML solutions, uh, which spans a broad range of performance, from microwatt level, you know, always on solutions to very high throughput. And we wrap it up with a tool chain that we call XNNC, which, is, which stands for our extensor neural network compiler, which attempts to the, the key value proposition there is high level of automation, and we try to fit into established use flows that our customers have rather than force something new. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a slide coming down the road. Uh, we, we are <clears throat> currently providing our AI solutions in three form factors. On the left, we have a, what we call our base platform. This is a set of DSPs with ISA extensions that we have defined to provide some significant uplift in performance for ML inferencing. Um, many of our existing DSP customers license these and run AI and software on the DSP with a you know, 2x, 4x uplift over the native DSP itself. But there are scenarios where power is very important there are scenarios where the performance is insufficient. And then we have a boost family of products which attaches a hardware accelerator to the DSP. So you can imagine the DSP is running domain-specific processing and the accelerator is running ML inferencing concurrently. And this gives them a two to three X performance uplift. And this is again wrapped up with the tool chain uh, which has an uh, optimized set of libraries for the neural network ops and hardware offload support with standard interpreters or compilers. So for example, TFLM or uh, XNNC compiled throughput. And then there are some customers who don't want to get their hands dirty. They just want an AI engine where they can dispatch a network, get the results. So we offer an AI max family of products that's controlled by a host processor through an API. And these are much higher throughput products. So we'll talk a little bit about each of these. Uh, the pictorial representation of the application space. On the left, we have the ultra low power, always on, you know, keyword, wake word type of applications. All the way to the right, where you have a lot of vision, high, high definition video, and then ADAS and so forth. <clears throat> and where these products fit. A brief note on the software tool chain. Uh, 
Our primary goal with this software tool chain is to support the various use models that are prevalent in this industry today. Our customers are already using them for, for years and we need to fit into that flow. So there, is a, there are two flows, uh, roughly, uh, broadly. Uh, to begin with, this is all highly leveraged, highly based on open source, TVM, Glow, whatnot, and it is framework agnostic. So the users can develop their AI models in any framework of their choice. We can import either a floating point model or a pre-quantized model. And there is a no-touch flow for people who don't want to get involved in programming the internals of an AI network. That's on the left. We call it a compiled flow. It's effectively a model in, binary out type of thing. There are some other applications such as TFLM for audio or ANN where there's a delegate authority and you need a more uh, fine-grained interaction with the accelerator and that's the flow on the right. Okay, so a few thoughts, notes on, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk in other presentations uh, in the summit, pretty interesting I thought about how to evaluate AI engines, what are the metrics, so I thought it would be good to spend a few minutes talking about the design challenges and then switch over to how to evaluate these engines. The problem statement can be, is, is actually quite simple. The networks are increasing in size. The number of parameters is growing, the number of operations required is growing, and it ends up being a data flow problem. So I did a very abstract diagram on the right of how you would implement, someone would implement a ML engine in a SOC. Uh, fundamentally, there is a hardware accelerator which accelerates most frequent ops, most uh, cycle consuming ops. And then you say there are many other operations that are infrequently used or not so compute heavy and it doesn't make sense to spend die size on it those are in a programmable engine. Generically, this breakdown have, is common across all designs. And then you say, as this accelerator size grows, your bandwidth requirements grow quite high because these problems tend to be low compute intensity. The number of computes you can do with a given operand fetch is fairly low. So there is a very high bandwidth requirement there, and so you wrap it up with a local memory and you try to stay inside that local memory as much as possible. It's worth mentioning at this point. Uh, I classify potential users into two buckets. There are the end equipment manufacturers who know exactly what network they want to do and uh, they want to run, and they can optimize this engine for that network that they're interested in running. So they know the throughput, they know the network complexity, we have configurable knobs, they can size the local memory they can, so that everything sits locally if they so prefer. So that's one, one, use, uh, one class of users. But there is another class of users who are building generic SOCs for use by an OEM and they don't know what networks are going to be run by the OEM this year, leave alone two years down the road. <laughs> so. In a generic sense, the, you can't make any assumptions on how big the local memory needs to be that, that, that avoids spills altogether. So you have to look at your data flow and within the accelerator to minimize spills into DRAM. That's a very important topic here. All right. And then, of course, there are the structural challenges. Pretty much very, any high, comp, high throughput engine is going to adopt a vector approach or at least, or more preferably an array approach, a 2D or a 3D array, because arrays promote a lot of data reuse across the rows and columns. One of the big challenges in that is if these arrays need to operate efficiently across a range of image sizes, small images to large images, shallow images to deep images, and so on. So I like to say the array should adapt itself to the size of the 
image rather than the other way around to maximize utilization across a broad range of networks. Then there is the data flow problem. There are many new up, newer in the last couple of years, uh, such as depth separable, which have very little data reuse. And it becomes a bandwidth issue. How do you, if you build a 100 tops array, how do you use it effectively for a depth separable layer? It's a very difficult problem. And typically, we look at things like partitioning the array into multiple, so that you can fuse multiple layers and so forth. And finally, the local memory that we diagrammed previously is a fairly important piece in this whole thing to feed this beast with, especially in the face of layers which have irregular strides, irregular access patterns, keeping this engine busy is a very difficult task. So having said all that, how do we evaluate inference engine? This is motivated by we often, get a, we often get inquiries where somebody will say, what's your tops per watt? And <laughs> it's almost impossible to answer this question because what is an op? What network are you running? What types of ops are important to you, et cetera, et cetera? So MLPerf is great. It's a well-controlled, well-defined, and it's a set of meaningful metrics. Uh, there are a lot of links in here to uh, publications and papers that talk about this subject in greater detail. But the bottom line we're trying to say is the best way to evaluate an engine is useful work done per unit resource. So how many inferences can you do per unit area? How many inferences can you do per unit watt? What is your bandwidth per inference? These types of metrics are, are the most meaningful Tops per watt is an impossible question for an IP vendor to answer. <laughs> and one issue with this is people who are evaluating engines are actually evaluating a new engine under development for a tape out next year or year after. And these metrics cannot be, uh, for, you can't run ML perf on something that's not been fully developed. So getting these metrics is difficult. So that's the forward looking piece. Some of our savvy customers who've been doing this, who know, the, who, who have some experience in the area, they kind of ask us questions like, what's the max utilization your engine can achieve for this kind of an operation? What's the minimum volume, output volume you need to be able to achieve that utilization? Those sorts of questions give you some sense of what the accelerator is capable of and how it would work on generic networks. Okay. <clears throat> so, when we design our hardware and software, we follow a few uh, basic design principles. Uh, from a hardware perspective, when we did our first generation of this DNA accelerator, about three years ago, the key differentiation was sparsity. Um, we look at the activation map and the filter map simultaneously. And if either operand is zero, you skip it, move on to the next multiplier, next MAC operation. A lot of designs subsequently came out where they use sparsity to either reduce the bandwidth or power gate the MAC, but it doesn't give you a performance uplift. Uh, this gives a true performance uplift. I looked around and there are a few other people who talk about sparsity today. This, when it came out three years ago, was the first time it was available. Um, on an individual layer with whatever is the native sparsity in the network, we get 2x to 3x the performance, which means a 1 teramac engine would run as though it was a 2 teramac or a 3 teramac engine. On a full real network like ResNet 50, we get 1.5x type of speed up. The other thing that is important is the flexibility of the hardware accelerator. <laughs> the name of the game here is it only takes a few lines of Python to create a new operator and a new network structure. And your hardware needs to be flexible enough to be able to support something that comes up tomorrow, um, which means traversing 3D tensors in very flexible different ways, means um, shaping the array in different ways, and so forth. And on the software, like I said, you know, we want to 
have a compiler that's highly optimized gets really high performance, but more importantly, framework agnostic, supports models from any framework, and it fits the user's use model. Um, we do provide a range of optimization tools. The users can control accuracy versus throughput trade-offs, bandwidth versus accuracy, those sorts of controls are available. And finally, um, just a few things to think about for people smarter than me. Um, in the last year or so, um, we've started seeing uh, frameworks that sort of define, oper uh, de define operand types on the fly. A new operand type shows up in a new release. And they demand bit exact with some reference code that is being built. So I, 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 I want to put a plug in for TensorFlow and frameworks like that who did a good job where they predefined a set of data types that they're going to use and they defined the error band around the float, uh, Genie float implementation. Allows people to innovate, allows people to find different ways to solve the problem. But for better, worse, I mean, recently there has become this thing of being bit exact with the reference implementation that's out there, which doesn't seem to make sense for inference engines, and it kind of ties your hands. Uh, and finally, we spend a lot of time certifying the, these inference engines for ACLB and so forth. And it seems like a endeavor with a low return on investment. We spend a lot of time proving that the gates are good, but we're running an algorithm which is inherently fuzzy. And is, is this the right metric? Or if you really want to do safety, we need to rethink this whole certification process for inference engines and ML engines from a holistic point of view. OK, so to end here, fundamentally, this is the last slide. And at Cadence, we believe ML is going to be pervasive. It's not just the top level sexy applications of I can recognize a cat, but there are deeply embedded areas uh, where there are many NP complete problems and an ML advisor, advisor and some deeply, several different areas that we're looking at so we think it's going to become very pervasive, not just at the what we know today, but deeply embedded spaces. So we want to be a provider of uh, ML solutions across a broad space. Uh, our marketing guys like to say AI, we want to enable AI everywhere for everyone. That's the end of